Yes, we are. Thank you so much. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amanda McRae and I am the Director of United Nations Advocacy at Women Enabled International, which works to advance rights at the intersection of gender and disability worldwide. I am pleased to open this event on behalf of the Generation Equality Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership. We are a multi-stakeholder group of states, UN agencies, international organizations, civil society, philanthropic funds, and private sector actors working collabor collaboratively to accelerate movement towards gender equality. As many of us know, according to the World Health Organization and the World Bank, women with disabilities are 19.2% of the global population of women. That means that we account for nearly one in five women worldwide. Too often, however, we are not seen as women, girls, or non-binary persons. Our needs and priorities are not included as part of state policy to advance gender equality and women's rights. Our civil society organizations do not receive the funding we need to ensure our sustainability. And we are not given a seat at the table in the feminist discussions, or if we are, we often are not provided with the accessibility features or support we may need to take an active part on the substance of those discussions. But we are women, girls, and non-binary persons. And as such, our participation is essential to the strength of the movement for gender equality worldwide. A gender equality agenda that does not include us directly um, and reflect our priorities is a gender equality agenda that will not be successful. In today's event, the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership will share some background on one of the key ongoing processes for ensuring gender equality, the generation equality process. We will provide background on what this process is and developments in the process to date, and um, we will also share specific information about how our action coalition is engaging in the process. We will then hear from four actors um, from within the women with disabilities movement and outside of it, who've made commitments as part of the generation equality process that are specifically inclusive of both gender and disability. And finally, we will leave time at the end of the program for a dialogue between our audience members and our panelists about generation equality and about the movement for gender equality more broadly. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I'm going to start us out today with a little bit of background on the generation equality process. And just to say, if you have questions at any time throughout this session, you don't have to wait until the Q&A to input them. You can put them in the chat box and we will be keeping track of them throughout the session today. So give me one moment. I am quickly going to share my screen to allow you all to see a short PowerPoint presentation to assist with understanding this hectic process. Great, I hope that is being successfully shared with you now. So in this part of the presentation, I wanna share with you some information about what generation equality actually is, who is undertaking generation equality, the six key themes that have been identified within the generation equality process to advance gender equality. I'm gonna to talk to you about what action coalitions are and what they're working on what the outcomes of the process are to date and how persons with disabilities have been involved in the process to date as well. And then finally, I'm gonna leave you with a couple of guiding questions to be thinking about as you hear from my fellow Action Coalition members and leaders, and also from some commitment makers as they share their involvement in the process to date. 
So first of all, what is generation equality? <clears throat> generation equality is part of a Beijing plus 25 anniversary and review process. And my apologies, I have a little frog in my throat. I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. Beige, the Beijing Platform for Action, which is what Beijing refers to, is a document that was adopted at a conference in 1995 that was specifically setting benchmarks for ensuring gender equality and women's rights around the world. We're now 27 years from that date, and the generation equality process was put into place to mark the 25th anniversary and really accelerate progress towards gender equality. As part of the generation equality process, there were two virtual forums um, that came into play in Mexico City and in Paris last year. Um, these were meant to be civil society centered global gatherings for gender equality. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those were. These forums also served as the launch of a set of concrete ambitious transformative actions to achieve immediate and irreversible progress towards gender equality. So very high ambitions for this process and what it could be doing, particularly between now and 2026. So who is involved in the generation equality process? Well, the process is convened by a UN agency, UN Women, and I also want to thank you and women and our colleagues there for helping to organize and, and host this event and for their active participation in our um, action coalition. But beyond you and women, um, the governments of Mexico and France have both been intimately involved by hosting the two virtual forums I spoke about. There's also a civil society advisory group for this process. Um, and a number of other groups that are multi-stakeholder that help inform where generation equality is going and what the outcomes are. There are, as I said, many civil society organizations, states, international organizations, and so on there that are involved. And there's a specific focus on youth involvement and organizing as part of the generation equality process as well. As part of this acceleration towards gender equality, um, generation equality actors have identified six key themes to be pursuing over the next five years. Those include gender-based violence, economic justice and rights, bodily autonomy, and sexual and reproductive health and rights, feminist action for climate justice, technology and innovation for gender equality, and feminist movements and leadership. In addition to that, there is a, <clears throat> a side focus as well on women, peace, and security, and some additional actions as part of the generation equality process that revolved around that theme. Each of those thematic areas has a group of actors working together to create a blueprint and implement a blueprint from action around the world. We call these action coalitions. Uh, these are composed of states, UN agencies, international bodies, funders, private sector actors, and civil society. And we have so far worked together to develop blueprints for action, these concrete, ambitious, transformative plans for ensuring gender equality within our theme. And we're made up of both leaders, um, which are some of the people you hear from today, and commitment makers, people who have looked at the blueprint, have decided they want to take steps to help implement that blueprint and have made commitments in that regard. So far as part of the process, we have a few key outcomes. One is the global acceleration plan, which includes those blueprints for action I spoke about earlier. And I know my colleagues will go into detail later about what's in our action coalition's blueprint, but so you know, um, that acceleration plan contains detailed guidance on accelerating progress towards gender equality. It contains a set of priority actions under each, each of the six key themes we spoke about earlier, including feminist movements and leadership. And it's meant to galvanize work and commitments through 2026 from a variety of actors to try to accelerate gender equality. There is also the Women, Peace and Security Compact, um, which is 
sort of part of and sort of separate from the global acceleration plan, but outlines specific actions related to women, peace and security. Beyond that, there is a set of commitments that have been made by a variety of actors to the generation equality process and towards accelerating gender equality. These commitments are made within the framework of the Global Acceleration Plan, and there are over 2,700 of them to date. Of those commitments, there's approximately 100 that include both gender and disability within them. And we're gonna hear from some of those actors who made those commitments later on today. And then finally, there is an accountability framework that is on the verge of being launched as we speak. This accountability framework outlines a system for ensuring implementation of commitments and achievement of the Global Acceleration Plan. Um, and it will be launched in various parts between now and September of this year is our understanding. So look out for more information on that accountability framework. Quickly, just wanna share what the involvement of women um, and girls and non-binary persons with disabilities has been to date in part of this process. Right now, there are a number of action coalition leaders, but only two organizations that are involved in the action coalitions have a specific gender and disability intersectional focus. Um, and those are actually both here in the room, Women Enabled and CREA. We both serve on the Feminist Movements and Leadership Action Coalition. But outside of that, there has been significant organizing of feminists with disabilities from around the world uh, to help influence the process. Um, one group that's been involved in that is the Inclusive Generation Equality Collective, which developed an advocacy platform that my colleague Michaela will share in the chat um, towards influencing the outcomes of the generation equality process and is now working together on a number of efforts to ensure implementation of the outcomes of that process that's inclusive of feminists with disabilities. Beyond that, uh, actors from the disability rights space, including International Disability Alliance, European Disability Forum, and Women Enabled held side events at both, Paris, at both the Paris and Mexico City forums last year to ensure that the voices of women with disabilities were heard in that process. And then finally, persons with disabilities have really been involved in this process in pushing for accessibility in this space and in other feminist spaces. We received uh, significant support from the broader feminist movement for calling out accessibility barriers that happened at the virtual Paris Forum last year. And we thank all actors who are involved in that. But the Inclusive Generation Equality Collective is also working together now to develop a feminist accessibility protocol, a document meant to ensure that accessibility barriers like those that happened in Paris do not happen again in these feminist spaces to ensure gender equality worldwide. We hope to launch that later this year. Now, finally, as you hear from my colleagues from the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership, as you hear from commitment makers who've made commitments at the intersection of gender and disability, I want you to keep kind of a couple of questions in mind for yourselves and for them. One of those is why should women, girls, and non-binary persons with disabilities be involved in generation equality moving forward? And another is what do women, girls, and non-binary persons with disabilities need to be involved in generation equality and the push for gender equality more broadly moving forward as well? And I hope you'll get some answers to the first one um, as we go about today, and that you'll be reflecting on the second of those questions throughout the presentation. So thanks so much. I'm gonna stop the screen share now. If um, you would like access to the PowerPoint, please don't hesitate to email me after the session. I will drop my name in the chat box. But just to keep things moving along, I wanna pass the floor now over to three of my colleagues from the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership. We have Xenia Kellner from Young Feminist Europe, Melinda Wells 
from Equality Fund. And Suba, which is Widjasiri Wardena from Korea. So you all can come on camera now. I believe Zenia that you are going to go first. And so I will hand the floor over to you to talk about more about the work of our Action Coalition. Yes, thank you so much, Amanda, also for uh, this great introduction to the Generation Equality Forum. Um, because as we know, <laughs> It can be sometimes um, a bit, it's a complex process, but I think you gave a really good introduction. Um, I'm going to speak a bit about uh, what we have been doing so far, what the Action Coalition 6 on feminist movements and leadership is about, um, and a bit how we work. And then afterwards, we will also hear from Melinda and Suba uh, who will speak about um, the blueprint we developed um, and some um, things that will come up. So um, the Generation Equality Forum process, as we have heard, started almost three years ago. And one of the key outcomes are these action coalitions. And um, the groups that were selected to lead these action coalitions came together for the first time, I think, almost two years ago. So what happened in these past two years um, in, in this action coalition or in our action coalition on feminist movements and leadership? So of course, um, in this, in what makes the Generation Equality Forum special is really the um, attempt to explore new ways of multilateralism. So you now have different stakeholders from, from governments, and civil society, private sector, international organizations, youth organizations, all sitting together virtually, uh, of course, unfortunately still, um, and bringing, trying to co-create and co-develop a common agenda for a specific theme. So our theme in the Action Coalition was feminist movements and leadership. So the first year of the whole um, of our whole process was coming together on a regular basis and trying to develop priority themes under feminist movements and leadership. But of course, having so many different stakeholders present and one, um, I don't want to say table because that can be very exclusive the, uh, the, in one group um, is not so easy. So um, what was import an important step in the beginning was to really develop some working methods and some methodologies to see how can we really reduce the hierarchies and power imbalances within our groups, um, because there are groups that might not always or usually be present um, in, in these spaces. Um, we did face some challenges, of course, um, especially because um, there is not a lot of experience yet to work with so many different groups and stakeholders that have very different understandings of the formalities of a place or uh, what are the priorities of the theme. So the first year was very challenging, and, um, but also exciting. Um, and we were pushing each other to come to good conclusions. And it was also surprising that um, well, maybe not surprising, but uh, we also learned that there are also um, some really similar understandings across different stakeholders. So the first year was really this process of coming together and figuring out what is it that we want to do and what are our priority themes and really developing a blueprint for feminist movement and leadership for this theme. So we will hear about uh, the details of the blueprint because we decided on collectively on four to five priority themes and then also um, made as a group collective commitments to that. So commitments, we have heard Amanda talking about commitments before. Uh, and there are different types of commitments that people can make. So once the blueprint was there and the priority themes were there and developed, other organizations or uh, activists or governments, these different stakeholders could also become commitment makers and say, we want to do some type of commitment. So there are different categories. One category was really focused on 
action, which could be a financial commitment, a policy commitment, an advocacy commitment, or programmatic commitment. But there are also, and that's something I am specifically very excited about, and I think is something special, is every commitment maker was also um, obliged to commit to two different other types of commitments. One is a commitment to process. So over the next five years to really commit to engage actively in a transformative process with other commitment makers and leaders and explore different ways of leadership. And that's really um, important for feminist leadership. Um, and the second thing is a commitment to internal changes within um, own organizational structures. So those are also two commitments. Um, and that's where we are currently at, or this was how the first year looked like. The second year, um, that we, which we are almost concluding now, was more focused on, okay, now that we have a blueprint and have decided on commitments, how are we implementing them? And how are we measuring them? And um, of course, over the next five years, this leadership group will stay together and figure out how to implement and how to support the process. So we are still currently um, in the phase of uh, defining and redefining roles. We have working groups. We meet once a month with the whole group. Then we have sub-working groups. And um, yeah, we are developing, um, we are engaging in events. We identify advocacy moments. Um, yeah, and are currently also um, really engaging in this process of around, around accountability. Um, and yeah, I think before I um, speak too much, I think I gave a bit of an introduction to this. I hope it was helpful because we will now hear a little bit more in detail about the blueprint and what's in there. and the commitments that we made collectively and what's ahead. So Melinda or Suba, I think I will give the word to you now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Senya. Uh, it, it's over to me and good day to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I'm Melinda Wells. Uh, I use she, her pronouns and I'm speaking to you from my small blue workspace on the unceded traditional land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, also known as Ottawa, Canada. Um, and it's my pleasure to try and give you a little bit more detail about the Blueprint for Action. Um, you will have a link in the Google Doc that's uh, available to this call with the full Global Acceleration Plan. So I'm touching on some parts of the information in that plan, but um, those of you that want to do a deeper dive, um, much more detail is available to you there. Uh, as Zenia and Amanda mentioned, the Feminist Movements and Leadership is one of six action coalitions of the Generation Equality Forum. And um, also, as they mentioned, you know, it's a, it's a multi-stakeholder group committed to delivering concrete results for women and girls in all their diversity. So I will share with you here the vision statement um, that goes with the blueprint of Action Coalition 6. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some definitions and some of the specific areas of work. So the vision statement is, we envision that by 2026, feminist leaders, activists, women's human rights defenders, and their movements and organizations are fully resourced and supported to become sustainable, can carry out their work without fear of reprisal, and can advance gender equality, justice, peace, and human rights for all from an intersectional approach. So that's the high level vision. I would just say here, um, I think that everyone on this call are, are feminists and these definitions will not be um, unusual or surprising to you, but because this was a multi-stakeholder process, we felt that definitions were especially important, um, really making sure that when we say something, we all understand what it means. So I just give you a bit more context on that to give you a little bit of the flavor of the work. So um, we did spend a, a good amount of time 
defining feminist movements and ensuring that we all understood that this includes, but is not limited to trans, intersex and non-binary people, racialized people and indigenous women, women and persons with disabilities, women and persons living with and affected by HIV, uh, young feminists and girls, sex workers and other historically marginalized people. We also spent time understanding and really defining uh, what feminist led organizations and movements mean for us. And to make it clear, but that refers to activists, women's human rights defenders and groups who work from feminist and women's rights perspectives are led by the people that they serve, that have the promotion of women, girls and or trans intersex and non-binary people's human rights as their primary mission that they push for st structural change and address the issues at their root, and that they work on issues which are marginalized and contested. Again, I don't think any of this will be um, unusual for this group, but it's just important to, um, to, to let you know that a lot of time was spent on that because if the foundations aren't right, then everything else becomes more challenging. So I'd like to share with you now the four actions that were defined by this group as a part of the um, of this sort of global work plan that is set out in the acceleration plan. So the first of the four actions is to fund and support diverse feminist action uh, activists, organizations and movements. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the objective there is by 2026 to at least double the global annual growth rate of funding from all sectors committed to women-led, girl-led, and feminist-led movements. Uh, and, and fund in all their diversity, especially those that are led by historically marginalized women and people, including trans, intersex, and non-binary people. And as Inya mentioned, underneath that action, there are specific targets for financing, for changes in law and policies, and for data and accountability. So that's number one. Number two is promote, expand, strengthen, and protect civic space for women's human rights defenders, feminist action, organizing, and mobilization in all its diversity. So that speaks to promoting, expanding, strengthening, and protecting civic space across all domains, including online, and supporting the efforts of feminist activists in all their diversity to defend civic space and eliminate barriers to feminist action, organizing, and mobilization. And noting in that, that all data and accountability measures must follow the principle of do no harm. Again, under that second action, there are objectives around law and policy, data and accountability, and also around norms. So number three, is to advance substantive representation and increase meaningful participation, leadership and decision-making power of women, girls, trans, intersex and non-binary people in all their diversity through gender parity and transformative feminist approaches to policymaking. And then finally, the fourth action relates to strengthening young feminist-led and girl-led movements and organizations in all their diversity. And so the target there is by 2026, to allocate, monitor, and evaluate specific, flexible, financial, technical, and other resources for adolescent girls and young feminist leaders and their movements and organizations to strengthen them and create safe and inclusive spaces to lead share ownership and substantively participate in and, and co-create decision-making processes. And once again, you know, there are specific objectives you can find in the plan related to financing, to laws and policies, data and accountability. So that's you know, a very quick tour of the action areas. Um, Zenia mentioned collective commitments and also Amanda mentioned collective commitments on the Feminist Movements and Leadership Action Coalition. And I wanted to just uh, share with you a couple of those here uh, to give you a sense of, of that work as well. So the first collective commitment was the co-creation of a global alliance for sustainable feminist movements by June, 2022, to exponentially increase, sustain, and improve financial and political support for women's rights and feminist organizations and movements. 
And I would say, um, just speaking specifically to that one, because I have some insight into that uh, commitment, that that one is on track, uh, that membership for the Alliance for Feminist Movements will be opening by the end of this month or early July. Um, there's plans to have a bigger, splashier launch event later in September, but already the design work is, is um, well underway and close to completion on that one. The second collective commitment is to increase resources and support for existing funding mechanisms, programs and funds that provide direct, core, flexible, progressive, multi-year and sustainable funding to feminist organizations, groups and movements and activists, including those that are often hard to reach and who've been historically marginalized and criminalized. Third one is implement feminist practices by deepening understanding of intersectional feminist principles, practices, approaches, and leadership, and integrating them into the work of our organizations and institutions, as well as the action coalition, and across the generation equality process and accountability framework. And that's the one that Zinia particularly mentioned you know, that relates to really understanding how we work together and strengthening that, and continuing to build our muscles in that area. Uh, fourth is advance women's human rights defenders of all ages and in their all their diversity, protecting and enabling safe environments, especially online, and, and countering gender-based discrimination, stigma, and hate speech against them. And the last one, and then I will close my remarks, uh, is to identify data gaps and indicators for feminist movements and compile a set of rights-based indicators to strengthen our collective ability to measure, analyze, and deepen our advocacy on civic space, tra space trends, and progress for feminist mobilization, organizing and action in all its diversity. So, so that's a bit of a flavor. You have now the commitments that were taken, um, a sense of what the objectives are in this action coalition. Maybe the last thing I will say is, um, you know, you may have questions about how is this all going to play out and who is going to take what action. You know, I, I would say we are still really at the beginning of this process. Um, the entire Generation Equality Forum process was scheduled to begin in 2020. Of course, as a result of the global pandemic, all of these things have been pushed back. Um, so we are really at the beginning of this journey. There is still an opportunity to really um, shape how these things go forward. I think what this blueprint offers is a framework um, and a set of opportunities, uh, particularly for governments and donors, but for civil society as well, for the private sector, to engage um, in, a, in a joined up way that moves action forward um, in a multi-stakeholder process. Um, so welcoming questions that come later, but recognizing we may not have all the answers yet at this point, um, but an ongoing dialogue is what we need. So let me stop here and I'll pass it on to my colleague, Sufa. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Melinda, for that wonderful recap. Thank you, Xenia, for bringing us, uh, you know, kind of to the foundation, the fundamentals of our action coalition. And thank you, Amanda, and to Women Enabled International for this important event at the beginning of a very important week and for convening us all here together. So just a little bit about what uh, lies ahead for us. Um, so right now, you know, I just want to kind of say, begin by saying that we are working in our AC um, collaboratively in partnership uh, in a number of diverse multi-stakeholder AC leadership groups, working groups to conduct and direct the work of our action coalition. And we are also taking a lot more direct leadership of our own action coalition, which has been very exciting. We want to continue to be principle led and to be led by the blueprint that we all developed through a highly collaborative and intense process. You've heard a little bit about the blueprint already. And women and non-binary people with disabilities, as you've heard, are at the center of our vision, which is articulated in our blueprint. So they will continue to be at the center of all our work, including our advocacy efforts, uh, and they will, of course, continue to be in the leadership of our action coalition. Our plans for the future are shaped a lot by what we've learned in our time working together. 
and what we've learned from what we've already accomplished. For example, earlier this year, we were able to successfully convene a cross-sectoral group of action, co uh, action coalition leaders from across all action coalitions in a joint advocacy and strategy session on climate justice and feminist movements. This showed us that there is an interest in truly collaborative learning and strategizing, and that, that there is a thirst among AC leaders to center and integrate some of the most pressing issues facing feminist movements in their work to really practice intersectionality, not just to talk about it. We really want to build on this opportunity that we saw to create more similar opportunities for cross AC thinking and learning, showing how each action coalition's agenda is closely inter interconnected to others. Members of our action coalition are also able to be leading and be a part of the Global Alliance for Sustainable Feminist Movements another bold cross-sectoral effort. And this is an essential part of our approach to resource mobilization and the health of our movements. Here we have seen a shared commitment to feminist leadership and to feminist movements that puts resources and an interrogation of inequity of resources at the center of the process and at the center of the conversation. So as to what lies ahead, Right now, we're focusing on our commitments, as you've heard, and we are focusing our advocacy on other commitment make makers, especially states and philanthropic organizations, making sure that we keep the pressure on all commitment makers to do right by their commitments. We really want to, in particular, focus on collective commitments, which we think are a special hallmark of the GEF process. First, accountability is key to our plans, and we plan to take a 360 approach to accountability in our own action coalition, including ensuring that we are thinking about ways to keep ourselves accountable. Staying accountable to movements led by disabled feminists, for example, is an essential part of this plan. We hope to do webinars like this one for movement actors, where we report out our progress and ask for feedback and make ourselves available to questions and concerns being raised by movements. Second, in terms of our advocacy efforts, we want to build on what's already being done. We don't want to duplicate, talk over, or draw attention away from the important advocacy being done by disabled feminist movements, LGBTI movements, young feminist-led movements, etc. We want to amplify, listen, and build on feminist movement voices. Finally, our work will continue to be based on our four action areas, uh, as Melinda and Senya have addressed. Resourcing feminist leadership and movements, protecting and expanding civic space, increasing support for feminist leadership, and girls, uh, women, and non-binary people in all areas of decision-making, and finally, supporting movements led by girls and young feminists. These four areas, which are not just areas of action, but key principles which are really important to all of us, hope to address the important facts of exclusion that Amanda raised right at the start of this side event. In order to build feminist futures, we must ensure that women and non-binary people with disabilities and other structurally excluded women and people are able to demand their rights and participate, participate in decision-making in all areas. Thank you. Thanks so much, Suba. Thanks so much, Zenia and Melinda for joining us today and providing that kind of important background information about the work of our, our Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership. Now I want to turn to some of our commitment makers, and particularly commitment makers who've made commitments at the intersection of gender and disability as part of this process. As I shared earlier, there have been more than 2,700 commitments made by states, UN agencies, civil society organizations, and others as part of the generation equality process and approximately 100 that specifically include disability. I hope that the commitment makers we hear from today will set an example for others 
who might consider uh, inputting into this process and making commitments that are inclusive of this gender and disability intersection. So for now, I want to welcome to the floor Ashrafun Nahar Misti from the Women with Disabilities Development Foundation in Bangladesh. Misty, floor is over to you. If you'd like to turn on your camera, great. Um, otherwise, you can speak from where you're at. Yes, thank you very much. Um, good evening, good morning, everybody. Uh, as we are living in 360 degrees, so uh, maybe different time is there. Uh, I want to just uh, give uh, a very short uh, introduction about our organization, Women with Disabilities Development Foundation, WDDF, where uh, I am the executive director and also founder. Um, basically, this organization started its work uh, due to there were no platform to amplify the women with disability voice uh, in the mainstreaming women rights and disability rights movement in Bangladesh. So it is our great opportunity uh, today that we can make some commitments with, which is in light of the uh, Generation Equity um, uh, Forum. and. Um, we basically work on disability issue and uh, disability inclusion is our main priority. But beside that, as you know, uh, women and girls with disabilities is human being. So they have also uh, different kinds of needs due to their different type of disability and the situation is different in uh, urban, rural and uh, different area, um, not only in Bangladesh, but also around the world. So. Uh, we basically make uh, uh, much awareness among disability inclusion. We do advocacy on the uh, women and uh, girls with disabilities, uh, human rights, and also protect violence against them. Uh, so in this forum, I want to make a uh, full commitment, which is very much related with the actions, coalitions, uh, commitment and thematic area of six, uh, 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 um, six areas of uh, GEF. That one is uh, protect uh, violence, gender-based violence against uh, girls and women with disabilities um, in their own family, in their own community, and in the state level. We also try to amplify the voice um, with uh, other organization, mainstreaming women rights organization, disability rights organization, human rights organization too raise their voice in the same uh, which we do. Uh, second, we want to make our commitments to um, uh, bring more leadership capacity, develop uh, uh, the capacity of girls and women with disabilities to uh, be a leader and uh, do function their activities in their own community uh, to change the uh, situation in our country which is very, very helpful and not uh, really dignity. Third is, uh, we are trying to uh, work on the um, uh, sexual and reproductive health rights in our country, which is very much important. Uh, simultaneously, we are trying to make uh, awareness uh, materials. We're trying to consult with our government, non-state um, uh, stakeholder, and also uh, the INGOs who are uh, working on uh, HRH issues. Uh, in Bangladesh and also in international level. Fourth, we are trying to work on the environmental justice, uh, which is very much related with the uh, accessibility. We are focusing on access to justice, access to uh, institutions, access to uh, healthcare service and other um, uh, relevant uh, uh, spaces. And also we are thinking for Climate changes, which is also our main uh, uh, commitment because climate change is affecting the girls and women with disabilities life and the displaced from their own community. And you know, maybe there is huge uh, number of uh, refugees in our country from uh, Burma or Myanmar uh, in certain particular area where girls and women with also living. WDDF started working with different type of community people like with ethnicity, religious minority, and others 
uh, type of um, indigenous uh, people who have girls and many disabilities in their own community. So I see there is, we see there is uh, different types of situation and their living condition is much different even they live in same area. Uh, so we make our commitment to reduce discrimination against girls and men with disabilities from any kinds, uh, any uh, kinds of institutions, community or uh, in the institution level. I think that uh, we can work jointly and we can learn from each other, which uh, will help us a lot to uh, carry forward our duties uh, and to make more human rights dependent from the women and uh, girls with disabilities communities. Thank you so much. I want to stop my speech here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Misty, and in particular for sharing with the audience today how organizations that do work at this gender and disability intersection can make commitments and be involved in this push for gender equality with rural and urban women, with disabilities, with refugee women with disabilities and beyond. I'm really great to hear your perspective on this process. Now I want to bring to the floor Natalie Guzman Figueroa from the UN Population Fund to share some of their commitments as part of generation equality. So Natalie, over to you. Thank you very much, Amanda. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is with great pleasure to join you for this side event. I would like to thank uh, the organizers first, so the Generation Equality Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership for inviting UNFPA. UNFPA's 12 commitments at the Generation Equality Forum demonstrate our dedication to fighting for every single girl and woman, including those with disabilities, to benefit from gender equality and realize their bodily autonomy. UNFPA committed to strengthening access to sexual and reproductive health, including actual access to contraception and comprehensive sexuality education, as well as ending gender-based violence and harmful practices, such as gender fem uh, uh, genital uh, mutilation, female genital mutilation, I'm sorry, and child marriage. We do this with uh, uh, women's organizations feminist movements and women human rights defenders of all ages and in all their diversity, including organizations of persons with disabilities and their representatives. Most notably, our 12 commitments include empowering women and girls, especially those for this left behind, to make autonomous decisions about their bodies, sexuality and reproduction, and to make advances in health, in education, income and safety, and gain autonomy. Our commitments span over several action coalitions, including the Action Coalition on Bodily Autonomy and SRHR, where we are uh, colleagues, and where we have made commitments, including the Action Coalition on Gender-Based gender Violence, the Action Coalition on Technology and Innovation for Gender Equality, and the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership. These commitments, were set out as a way to accelerate the unfinished agenda of the ICPD program of action. Following the ICPD 25 commemoration, UNFPA worked to connect the 1,250 plus commitments that were made at the Nairobi summit and the generation equality commitments. All of our work at UNFPA including the generation equality commitments are shaped by our leaving no one behind operational plan and commitment to utilizing a human rights based and gender transformative approach as accelerators in our current strategic plan. For example, in the action coalition on bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights, UNFPA and other colleagues worked hard to ensure that women and girls in all their diversity were represented in the Action Coalition Blueprint. This is with the recognition that SDG 5 is far from being met and for women and girls facing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. In particular, women and girls with disabilities face multiple forms of discrimination because of their gender, ability, age, and economic status. Women with disabilities are up 
to 10 times more likely to experience gender-based violence, and they are routinely denied their right to bodily autonomy. Uh, there are a lot of taboos and misbeliefs around women with disabilities, sexuality that translate into gender-based violence. We know that uh, they are prohibited from getting married and they may be institutionalized and sterilized against their consent. So UNFPA is committed to ensuring all women and girls, including those with disabilities, have the right to us access SRH and GBV information and services and can exercise their bodily autonomy. We are connecting our generation equality commitments with our broader work in UNFPA to ensure synergies. With our newly published disability inclusion strategy so, uh, and our flagship program on disability inclusion, the We Decide program supported by Spain, we build on existing efforts within UNFPA country programs among the UN system and with national and regional efforts to promote the human rights and active participation of women and girls with disabilities in both development and humanitarian contexts. Partnering with women-led organizations, including OPDs, is a key part of this work. UNFPA will continue implementing our commitments and ensuring we address the inequalities, discrimination and exclusion COVID-19 has led bare. It is in our hands to work for a world where gender equality is realized for all women and girls. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natalie, for sharing those strong commitments made by UNFPA as part of the generation equality process. Now, at this point, we've heard from an organization active on the women with disability space, from a UN agency with a strong commitment for, of disability inclusion in their work. And now I want to turn the floor over to one of our philanthropic funds that has also made strong commitments to the generation equality process. So, Tarira Tandy from Urgent Action Fund Africa is joining us today. And Tarira, I invite you to the floor. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I'm, I'm having a terrible cold, so I'm not going to put my camera on. I look terrible today. Um, I hope people can hear me and I'll try to be a bit slow so that I am audible. Um, <clears throat> maybe I can just give a line or two about the work that we do as Agent Action Fund Africa. Um, as a fund, we work to support African women, human rights defenders, their organizations, their collectives and movements so that they are able to take actions um, that sustain their work and themselves usually before, um, during and after Agent Actions in their context. So we do this by uh, providing them with technical solidarity and financial resources um, so that they are able to then organize within their movements. And we are very intentional in our funding to be able to ensure that we involve or we work with those that are usually excluded and find it harder to be able to access resources um, and in this instance, women with disabilities, the LBTQI, uh, indigenous communities, rural communities. Uh, with the GEF process, we made a commitment um, of two million US dollars uh, towards mobilizing funds for women human rights defenders and women's rights organizations in Africa and space. Uh, explicitly we are focusing on Kenya, Uganda, Malawi, Rwanda, Burkina Faso, South Africa and Tunisia and we did this so that they would be able to engage in monitoring um, and advocacy around the commitments that their national governments and other stakeholders made during the GEF. The advocacy, we also were explicit in our commitment that we wanted the inclusion of community-based priorities to ensure that rural women, indigenous women, women with disabilities, LBTQI, sex workers would have their rights met in policy 
and legal informed so that their rights would be guaranteed and that um, different countries would be able to achieve gender equality. Because as we all know, I think Amanda did allude to the fact that, you know, since 1995, this is 27 years later, we've still not been able to achieve gender equality. We did this as part of our commitment as a Pan-African Feminist Fund that has committed to mobilize resources for African women human rights defenders in all their identities on the continent to be able to engage in effective organizing. We also saw this as an opportunity, especially after everything that happened during GEF, where we saw <clears throat> women with disabilities and women from rural communities struggling to actually participate meaningfully in the space. So we thought making this commitment would ensure that women with disabilities would never uh, find themselves um, excluded, or at least we would ensure that they would not be excluded um, furthermore, including constituencies that are usually driven to them margins of society and singling them out, um, such as persons with disabilities, was also a recognition of how um, constituencies that are further marginalized find themselves at the bottom of the rank when it comes to attaining gender equality. So what we are currently doing right now is we are fundraising further since we committed funding. And for us as a fund, 30% of our funding has to go towards women with disabilities, support their initiatives, support their participation in convening spaces, support their advocacy initiatives. We are also engaging in influencing where we are supporting organizations, collectives, movements to proactively engage with the GEF process to enable them to engage with their governments who made commitments, also giving them accompaniment um, as they engage in their different work. We are also writing opinion pieces that are meant to influence funders in different spaces. We've written articles that have been published in the Alliance magazine. Um, we've also written to uh, Mail and Guardian. We are also offering capacity strengthening of our partners so that they are able to really understand what is happening around the GEF process so that they are also able to articulate uh, what is happening within the process. But at the same time, also look at the different complex documents that are there to ensure that they are palatable, they're in a language that they can understand. So sometimes that even includes translation into a language that they actually can understand and be able to digest. We also, um, looking at uh, supporting um, feminist groups, giving them funding to engage in uh, information sharing uh, with their different communities, following up on what's happening with GEF, and also holding their governments to account. And lastly, we continue informing partners and movements about what is happening within the GEF a follow-up and accountability process. So this is what we're doing in short. Uh, thank you so much for providing us with this space. Thank you so much, Tariro, and for joining us, even despite your cold today. Um, I really appreciate having your perspective. Um, and now, um, last but not least, I want to turn the floor over to a colleague from the broader feminist movement, Gretchen Gasteyer from Women Deliver to share a little bit about their commitments and how those are inclusive of gender and disability. So over to you, Gretchen. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm very glad to be here today and to represent Women Deliver. Um, my name is Gretchen and I'm the co-lead uh, for the Women Deliver Conference, uh, which will be held in July, 2023 in Kigali, Rwanda. The Women Deliver Conference is a gathering of advocates from around the world who galvanize momentum towards gender equality and collective action for girls and women in all their intersecting identities. The commitment that we made was in partnership with the Adolescent Girls Investment Plan, Outright Action International, CREA, Women Enabled International, the governments of Canada and Denmark, and the Rockefeller Foundation, 
to develop an inclusive, diverse, accessible, and consultative women deliver conference that is co-led and co-created. We know that it is critical that girls and women with disabilities are integrated and centered in the gender equality movement. As Amanda said earlier, nearly 20% of girls and women worldwide have a disability and are underrepresented in decision-making bodies and gender equality institutions. We hope that the Women Deliver 2023 conference will be a moment to not only include girls and women with disabilities, but to recognize them as leaders in a range of issues related to advancing gender equality. Some of the ways that we are prioritizing accessibility and inclusion at the conference are by ensuring organizations of persons with disabilities are included in the conference co-creation, are represented on our conference advisory group, and are consulted from the beginning of the planning processes. We are conducting accessibility audits of both our physical conference spaces and our digital platforms and have committed to working with the government of Rwanda to make any necessary physical changes to the conference spaces to make them accessible for our participants. We are also committed to training our staff and our vendors on inclusion and accessibility best practices and we are committed to, to providing closed captioning and sign language interpretation throughout the conference and our events. We also are prioritizing people with disabilities as conference speakers and scholarship recipients to attend the conference. And finally, we are adding child safeguarding expertise, mental health support at the conference, and we'll have trauma-informed specialists there to provide support, as well as silent spaces uh, provided at the conference. So we're very excited to work with Women Enabled International and our partners to ensure that we deliver on these commitments at Women Deliver 2023. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gretchen, and to all the commitment makers for, for joining us on this um, event today. And I know Gretchen has to run to a, another call, so we appreciate your time. And if you have any questions specifically for her, we'll make sure to note them down and pass them along. Um, but with that in mind, um, we are now at the point of being able to open the floor to questions or comments from our audience. If you would like to ask a question, you can either do so in the chat or you can do so live. If you'd like to do it live, please use the raise hand function, which you can access by clicking on reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen and clicking raise hand or simply by turning on your camera and then we will see you readily there. We have a couple of questions that have also come in through uh, the chat box. So maybe we'll start with one of those and wait for others to be inspired to ask more. So the first question comes from Adina Faye Carton. Adina asks, in rural areas of developing countries, village health workers are a powerful feminist resource for empowering inclusion of disabled beneficiaries. Are there any commitments that address this important aspect of development and disabled women's empowerment and inclusion, or less specifically commitments to rural women and making sure they also have a voice at the table. So I'd welcome any of our action coalition leaders or commitment makers to, shine, to chime in on that question about the inclusion of rural women and specifically rural women with disabilities in the commitments and in the process for generation equality. Uh, maybe I could take this one, Amanda, and then Thanks. maybe um, our colleagues could chime in if they'd like to add something as well. I think this is a really important question. I mean, I was just thinking about the context where I come from in Sri Lanka or where Kriya does a lot of local level work in the community in North India, for example. Um, and I think this question really reflects that knowledge that it is absolutely true uh, that health workers, um, you know, in Sri Lanka, for example, we have a lot of midwives um, in the rural and suburban settings who are really doing uh, extremely important um, work protecting um, people's right to health. 
uh, and are sometimes working against the grain. So, you know, not that they're supported necessarily even at, in, all, in, in all circumstances. Sometimes they're working against uh, the grain or against what they are being told to do uh, to protect, um, you know, people's right to help. Uh, and absolutely uh, working to include people, women with disabilities, um, young people with disabilities, ensuring their right to access health services. Uh, I think this is a very important part of our agenda in terms of making space and supporting um, the decision making of, of, of feminists, young feminists, um, and these feminists, you know, who are our health workers, who are our midwives, uh, supporting states to ensure that their decision-making capabilities are a given space. So I think that goes to one of our, our sort of core tenets and core action areas, you know, really pushing states to make sure that these women are also at the center of any decision-making space um, in rural settings, uh, but also in other settings. So I think it's really important to kind of amplify them as decision-makers. Great, thanks so much for that input, Suba. Um, and while other commitment makers and leaders and panelists today um, are thinking about that question, I, oh, I see Misty has turned on her camera. Misty, do you want to input on this? Yes, yes. I, actually, I want to focus on the um, critical uh, issues uh, about women with disabilities, economical empowerment or involvement in the um, uh, economical growth. Uh, there is a uh, huge um, opportunities for girls and women with disabilities uh, in the society could be created if uh, donor agencies, INGOs, government become uh, positive. Otherwise, it's not possible because uh, due to um, uh, disability and the uh, communication gaps, uh, also the devices and other needed uh, is uh, uh, make some kinds of barrier for girls and women with disabilities who participated in the uh, regular um, uh, platform, who is uh, made capable for uh, rural areas uh, uh, women. Uh, in particularly, uh, there is a chore area that means um, uh, the flood affected area, and also there is the um, uh, tribal area. So, if we think that um, Girls and women with disabilities will uh, be uh, capable to um, uh, done their economical growth or economically empowered. There should be some special initiatives which include disability inclusion. And we raise our voice on these issues um, in the um, state uh, party level with the, uh, some other authorities who are working with government, uh, some uh, INGOs, some uh, uh, public and private companies who is uh, make some opportunities. You know that in our country there is vocational training center which is still not accessible for uh, persons with disabilities, where uh, the boy has some opportunities to get support from the society people. Girls and women with disabilities don't have any opportunities to take cooperation outside of their family in our society, so they cannot exist in the private institutions who is um, uh, give the technical education uh, to persons with disabilities. But there is a skill policy. 5% uh, girls and women with disabilities have a scope to uh, include uh, in this vocational training center, but there is no skill policy. So I think that we need to work on these issues more and more. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective, Misty, from Bangladesh and um, some work working with rural women with disabilities in that area in response to that question. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and uh, state and respond to the last question that we received, which is from Mariangel Garcia Ramos in Mexico. Uh, Mariangel asks, are there any kind of summary within the Generation Equality Forums and processes of how many of those commitments focus on gender and disability? And also, we know the Generation Equality Forum in Paris um, was not, and in uh, Mexico City was not accessible and inclusive, but do we have registered participation of feminists with disabilities or participations that ended in specific commitments? And thanks so much for that question, Marianne, how 
From the 2,700 commitments um, that have been registered for generation equality, um, an analysis that my colleague Virginia has undertaken has shown that there are about 100 that specifically include the gender and disability intersection. But all 2,700 commitments, of course, can include women and girls in all of their diversity, including women, girls, non-binary persons with disabilities. And so some of, some of the work that we and women enabled in conjunction with groups like Sight Savers, with the Inclusive Generation Equality Collective, with Disability Rights Fund, are trying to do is to ensure that those commitments are implemented in a way that's inclusive of the gender and disability intersection. And we hope to share more of that. Um, in terms of participation of feminists with disabilities um, and ending in specific commitments, I can't say whether that happened or not, but what I can say is since the Paris Forum, um, we have seen UN Women and the other actors involved in this space placing a significant priority on ensuring accessibility and meetings and events around the generation equality process and in their work more broadly. So I think there was a really strong lesson learned and taken out of the Paris Forum about accessibility and inclusion of women, girls, and non-binary persons with disabilities. We hope to be building on that momentum in the coming months and years as we're doing, undertaking this generation equality process. And I think the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leadership is um, really trying to take a leadership role in that regard. And so with that, um, we are at time and uh, we'll conclude the event. I really want to thank my fellow Action Coalition leaders, Melinda, Zenia, and Thuka for joining us today and sharing your insights. I also want to thank our commitment makers, Misty, Natalie, Torero, and Gretchen for also taking time today um, to join us. Thank you to all of the audience members for your active engagement and interest in this topic. If you wanna learn more, please do be in touch and we'll be happy to share more information. And then finally to our service providers, our CART closed captioner and our international sign interpreters for being with us today. I know it's just the beginning of COSP. I really hope everyone has a great week. And if you're in New York, I hope to see you at the UN tomorrow. So bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.